Thank you. Okay. So the next talk uh, is going to be by Paul Form. Are you there, Paul? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So uh, can you, you can share the screen? Okay, I can take over the screen. Yes, I will do that. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yeah. 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 My, um, mouse pointer. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. very good. So then I will get started. Uh, so um, thank you, everyone. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for this workshop to uh, uh, invite me to, to present and um, communicate to you the developments we have been doing here in Barcelona over the last year and a half. And so I'll be happy to uh, tell you a little bit about it and also our, our latest uh, work, which is the title of this, uh, of this presentation of a superconducting qubit used as a universal approximant. And I will explain you both what is a superconducting qubit and what is a universal uh, approximant uh, along the course of this, of this presentation. Um, so this work has been based at, at IFAE the Institute for High Energy Physics in Barcelona, where I started about a year and a half ago. And it has been in collaboration with the theory group of uh, Professor Jose Ignacio La Torre, which most many, many of you may, may know in person, and who recently moved to uh, Singapore to lead the Center for Quantum Technologies. So because this is going to be uh, more like a general uh, overview talk, not just about our latest results. So I'm giving here some outline. I will talk a little bit about the quantum computation status today. And I think this will connect um, a little bit with the previous presentation. Then I will give a very brief crash course on superconductivity uh, for qubits. And then I will uh, jump into the qubits themselves, what, what they are and how we manipulate them. Uh, after that, I will be able to introduce theoretically what is this uh, algorithm that was developed here and then how we implemented it. All right. So before I start, I wanted to introduce our group at IFAE. So um, uh, our group is the Quantum Computing Technology Group at IFAE, and I am the leader. Um, Manuel Martinez, he's a senior professor at IFAE. He, uh, he also joined, joined this project, so he's bringing in all his experience and now we already have uh, five PhD students and our project manager assistant. And if you want to find out more details, please visit our, our website. And um, besides IFAE, we have also uh, or established a, a spin-off company. It's a spin-off company from IFAE, but also from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and the University of Barcelona. It's called Kilimanjaro. And um, uh, here I'm showing uh, all the members of Kilimanjaro. The top row is the founders or co-founders. Uh, sorry, yes. Paul, but uh, I'm not sure we are uh, seeing the slides. Oh, you're not? Oh. I keep in seeing the first slide. Okay, that's strange. Um, uh, let me check again with my zooms. Okay, let me try uh, once more. Uh, I think I know why. Okay, do you see the slides changing? Yeah, now yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was the outline, and this is the people that uh, define. Sorry about that. And um, I was, uh, yeah, I was just introducing the Kilimanjaro project of uh, our with our five co-founders, uh, Jose Ignacio La Torre himself being one of the co-founders, and then Artur Garcia is the other physicist, active physicist um, that is uh, part of the founders. And then here we have all the. All the team, which already includes a theory and experiment, we are starting to put together our project. And you can also visit our website for, for more details. And um, this is uh, the status of our lab at IFAE. Let, let me interrupt you again, sorry. But we are also seeing uh, some uh, small windows regarding colors and, 
Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess you are seeing my full screen. I am. I'm not sure why it's not showing my it's, uh, presentation. Starting with the about fonts and about colors. So. Yeah, it's not a presentation. Yes, uh, it's just on the side of the of the screen. So. I don't know if you can do something about that. Mm. I think uh, it's, from, it's, it's, it's from yeah yeah you don't see it yeah I don't know what, what's going on uh, with uh, it, this is not uh, happened before to me I mean I use zoom every day so uh, I'm not sure why is it doing maybe that. you can close that window so that is my window well you're seeing the <laughs> the program I am using to edit the presentations oh but not it doesn't go in full screen mode um that's why I'm not able to understand this. Well, at least now it's more on the side. So no, now it's equally. Oh, OK, just go, yes, go on. It doesn't cover much of it. I don't know what's the problem. Sorry about that. OK. Uh, I will remove all the windows just not to bother. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Okay, let's do it like that. All right, so that's the status of our of our lab uh, at Ifaya. So this has been built over the last um, three, four months. So it's been a lot of progress. What you're seeing here is uh, two uh, cryostats, two dilution refrigerators. I will explain a little bit later what, uh, what they do. And so this lab is shared between Ifaya and Kilimanjaro. And so we are uh, all I will show, all the results I will show in this talk are actually not taken in this lab, but everything we do from now on will be happening here. Okay, so let me um, let me briefly uh, describe what's the quantum computing status today. Um, as probably most of you know, quantum computation is about evolving a quantum system that consists of many two-level systems uh, known as qubits. Uh, through a unitary process, ending up in a final quantum state that uh, contains information about certain problem we are, we are trying to, to solve. And this unitary process, because um, it involves entangling all of these qubits or most of these qubits with each other, uh, normally physically cannot be implemented in a single step um, by a single physical process. And so um, the digital quantum approach, the digital gate quantum approach of quantum computation breaks down this unitary into single qubit and two qubit gates. And here I'm showing just a couple of example circuits um, where uh, each horizontal line corresponds to the uh, time evolution of a single qubit and all the operations that are applied to that qubit. And at the end, uh, you, you do the measurement. So uh, these quantum algorithms, they, they can process all the Hilbert space of, of, the, of the set of qubits. Um, but in reality, um, there could be errors. So there could be the coherence and one of the qubits, one of the gates may be faulty, one of the qubits may decohere, and then you introduce errors and these errors propagate throughout your circuit and end up giving you the wrong answer. So in order to implement digital-based quantum computing, you need to apply quantum error correction. But quantum error correction is not uh, free lunch. It's very expensive. And the best approach we know today, uh, which is in this paper, the surface code, tells you that given the current um, qubit properties, the qubit uh, quality for, I'm talking about, sorry, I'm talking about superconducting qubits. This paper is about uh, planar geometries, which is compatible with uh, superconducting devices. So the surface code tells you that you need on the order of a thousand physical qubits to protect a, a single logical qubit. So that means if your algorithm requires you um, a thousand qubits to simulate some molecule, or if you want to solve some particular algorithm, that means you need a million physical qubits to implement it. And so we are a bit far away from um, being able to, to run this, um, this kind of algorithms uh, properly. Therefore, 
we are in a different kind of era in quantum computing that uh, John Praskill uh, named NISC, which is the noise intermediate scale quantum devices era. And that's where we are right now. So we having prototype quantum processors that they have decoherent, they have errors. So, so they're faulty because we are not yet able to implement quantum error correction. Um, but the devices are growing in size uh, very quickly over time. And they are already at the limit, at least a couple of them are already at the limit of what classical computers can do uh, for very specific, I would say, academic problems, not yet very useful problems. So um, in order to extract something useful out of these devices today, um, there's a need to exploit um, these limitations of classical computers with a new generation of quantum algorithms. And these are broadly called variational algorithms, which integrate the power of classical uh, processors and quantum processors. And in fact, the example I will explain today, this um, uh, unary, sorry, the universal approximant is, is part of these, of these algorithms. There's other examples like the quantum adiabatic approximation algorithm or quantum annealing. And normally what these algorithms do, this is in a, in a nutshell what they do, you initialize your, your qubits, there's a set of unitary gates applied to those qubits and then you perform a measurement. Normally it's me the measurement of the energy of the system. And that uh, parameter now becomes a class, it, it is a classical parameter, that's our, our measurement, uh, is fed into some cost function that depends on a set of uh, parameters itself. And uh, this is given uh, into this cost function and then the cost function has certain value. And then this is fed into a classical optimizer that uh, fits a new set of parameters into the circuit. And then this algorithm is run again and a new measurement is made and then the cost function is evaluated once again until you converge to the lowest value of this cost function. So this uh, combines um, these, these gates which may have errors in which case you simply take longer to get to the optimal value of the cost function. And then these classical optimizers which could be uh, the, the, any, anyone, any optimizer that you think about that could be, could be useful. So that's what's basically happening these days when you hear about uh, quantum computation. Um, this is a little bit uh, what the state of the art is in superconducting devices. And all these three examples I'm putting here are actually companies because uh, already for the last uh, seven or eight years, the largest uh, uh, computer uh, companies in the world, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Intel, and, and others have joined this race and they are actually betting on superconducting devices to build quantum computers. And the largest so far is the one built by Google that probably all of you know that last year they uh, demonstrated what they call the quantum supremacy with a 54 qubit device. Uh, but there's, there's this other companies, Rigetti is a, is, a spin -off, is a startup company in the Silicon Valley. And uh, they also have uh, superconducting devices and they, you can actually um, con control their, their systems online. They allow you access. And IBM does, uh, in fact, uh, this, this remote, this cloud quantum computation was pioneered by IBM already since 2015. And by now they have um, a multitude of, uh, of machines you can uh, use and they keep on, on increasing their, um, yeah, their uh, size and, and, and quality of, of their qubits. But we're still far from quantum error correction. Um, that submit, uh, um, uh, I wanted to highlight that there's not only uh, superconducting uh, quantum uh, devices companies, there's also others based on ion traps. This is ion Q in the center from uh, from uh, Maryland in the US and and in fact all of these companies that I'm listing here are using quantum gates but D-Wave is actually selling quantum annealers so D-Wave is actually the uh, the oldest I mean in quantum computing is the oldest of all of them it's been around for almost 20 years and they've based their business uh, model using quantum annealers but besides the Americans, there's some in Europe. One of them is Kilimanjaro, our company here in Barcelona. And then there's IQM, which is probably the largest so far. 
and it's, it has headquarters in Finland, but also offices in Germany. And there's also Oxford quantum circuits. These are, I mean, I want to uh, clarify, these are uh, hardware quantum computing companies. There's other uh, quantum companies in, in, in Europe, but these are the ones doing quantum computation, developing hardware. Okay, so that's about the quantum computation. Uh, that's enough for what you need to know. So now I'm gonna start talking about our particular platform, which is the one of superconducting devices. And since probably most of you are not uh, familiar with superconductivity, I wanted to just give a very, very brief overview. So a superconductor is actually a kind of a condensate, it's a macros macroscopic uh, quantum system, and it can be described by a single wave function. Uh, what I'm showing here, this, this is a block of superconductor that you imagine is uh, the temperature, which is well below the critical temperature at, at which superconductivity kicks in. And so we can describe this macroscopic wave function with a certain amplitude and, and a phase. So these, uh, you know, superconductors, they can carry a charge, so currents, without dissipating any heat. But um, the really interesting aspects of superconductors is this, is this uh, macroscopic wave function that allows you to design uh, quantum, quantum devices and quantum circuits. Because the, uh, this uh, charge and phase of the wave function, uh, the charge of, that is built in this block of, of uh, superconducting material and the phase of the wave function are canonically conjugate variables in the same way as position and momentum are for for the classical, uh, for, sorry, for the mechanical oscillator. Um, so this is for a single block of uh, superconductors. If you bring in another block um, of superconductor and you bring it very, very close, um, sorry, now of course this, in my slide, it would be touching each other. Um, there, there is tunneling, there is quantum tunneling established between both uh, blocks. If this insulating barrier in between is sufficiently thin. Um, so this is called, it's known as the Josephson uh, effect. And uh, this is uh, what I'm showing here is, is the Josephson tunnel, tunnel junction. Um, here they are together. Uh, so this, uh, this effect, this current, this super current is described by the first Josephson relation, which was already um, postulated or calculated in 1962 by Brian Josephson. And it tells us that the supercurrent uh, crossing this boundary has a certain maximum, which is known as the critical current. And is, this, is, this is related to the transparency of this barrier. And then is proportional to the sign of the phase difference between the two blocks. So it is a nonlinear relation between a macroscopic quantity, which is the current that we can detect, and the uh, microscopic properties of the, of the wave function. Excuse me. Um, the second Josephson relation, it actually tells us that the voltage across this junction is uh, proportional to the time derivative of the phase. And uh, together with these two equations tells you how this, um, uh, how this phase responds, how this um, circuit element res responds uh, in a circuit. So here I'm introducing some uh, quantities. This phi naught is the flux quantum, is a fundamental constant of nature. And then this junction can store energy. Uh, and the energy is also dependent on the phase difference, but here is with the cosine. And the prefactor Ej is the Josephson energy, which is essentially proportional to the critical current. So these are the typical um, parameters you, you encounter when you start using Josephson junctions. If you combine the first and the second Josephson relations, you find out that the time derivative of the current that crosses this junction is, um, is a function of the voltage, but of the current itself. And if you know a little bit about electronic circuits, you'll realize that all of these can be put into a, a, a this should be all of this, uh, can be put in a form of an inductance. So this is the inverse of an inductance. And this is called a Josephson inductance. So in fact, a Josephson junction from the electrical circuit's point of view is a nonlinear, non-dissipative uh, inductance. And that's uh, very important for, it's essentially the key element for uh, superconducting qubits. In fact, it is so uh, widely spread that it has its own electrical symbol and it's this cross. Um, 
And in reality, this is what they look like. I'm, this picture here is a scanning electron uh, microscope micrograph. Uh, so this, what I'm showing is seen from the top and it's uh, like two, uh, two layers, one on top of the other. And you see, this is aluminum. It's the material we uh, generally use for qubits and it's quite small. This is about uh, 10 times smaller than the width of a human hair. So they are, they are tiny. And that requires you to uh, implement, to in order to fabricate these devices, you need to go to clean room and implement uh, lithography techniques that are usual, they are conventional for uh, the semiconductor industry. Okay, so we have this, um, uh, now we know a little bit about this Josephson effect. Um, we can now start talking about qubits. Um, the first of the qubits, in fact, this is the only one I will be uh, describing in detail, is known as the charge qubit. For that, to understand, I will use a more like a physics picture that um, uh, to, to explain what this qubit is. Imagine you have, again, this block, isolated block of a superconducting material that contains N uh, Cooper pairs. This is called, known as the Cooper pair box. So this, this box can be um, bias, voltage bias by a, a voltage gate source. And then this gate, what it does, it lifts or lowers the potential of this box with respect to some big reservoir, which is an electrical ground. Um, so the energy of this box is essentially is the energy of the capacitance of this box with respect to ground. And it has this simple expression, which is classical. Here, I'm just putting classical um, electromagnetism into play. And this energy depends on the N, which is this number of uh, Cooper pairs, and uh, Ng, which is the, um, essentially is the effective number of Cooper pairs, but that are virtually um, injected by this external gate voltage. This is like a polarization kind of um, uh, knob. And so as a function of this gate voltage, the energy of the Cooper pair box is a parabola. And different numbers of Cooper pairs will have different parabolas. So at some point they cross. And classically, the energy is degenerate between n and n minus one or n and n plus one. But now this is not a classical system. It's a quantum system. And we do something else. Now we connect this box to ground via this junction. So now we are allowing tunneling of Cooper pairs across the junction. And this uh, uh, junction adds a new term in the Hamiltonian. So now I'm going to start using the Hamiltonian notation. And I will have the uh, energy, the charging energy term. And now this is the Josephson energy that I talked about before. So this uh, Josephson term, what it does, it opens up a gap in the spectrum. Uh, now there is no more degeneracy anymore. So there is a, an avoided level crossing. And this, uh, this point here, where there is this gap, the uh, eigenstates of the system are coherent superpositions of charge n and n minus one. And so this is the one we call a charge qubit. So it, we just focus on the lowest two states of this, uh, of this uh, uh, spectrum, because of course there are many more levels if you look at higher energies. But because we, in qubits, we only, in quantum computing, we only look at the lowest or just two, two states and typically is the lowest two states in energy uh, scale. So these are the two ones used for qubit. But as you can see, this spectrum is quite curvy. And that means that if there is not a gate voltage, but the noise, uh, charge noise or a voltage fluctuating uh, that is changing the potential of this island, that means I will be wiggling on the x axis and that will cause a wiggling on the vertical axis so that will be essentially introducing noise and unfortunately in electrical circuits there is a lot of charged noise so this was this qubit that cooper per box was the first ever superconducting qubit measured in 1999 but it was very bad the, the coherence was very bad and uh, very uh, soon after the early years of superconducting qubits it was discarded and so people moved on to do something else it took some time, but uh, the group in Yale, the group of Professor Rob Shulkov and Michel Devore, 
they uh, realized that by introducing a large enough capacitance, you can actually uh, lower. So uh, if we will go back to this expression. So if you make this capacitance large, you will essentially lower this curvature of the, of the charge spec spectrum up to the point that it can become completely flat as a function of gate voltage. And so now this qubit is uh, totally insensitive to charge fluctuations because the energy splitting doesn't change. And mm, it's uh, so different, let's say qualitatively different from the Cooper per box that they call it something else and they call it the transmon qubit. And this is, in fact, this is the most widely used qubit uh, right now in, the, in academia and in the industry because it only needs one single junction and then and one capacitor. So it's very simple to fabricate and it's uh, actually quite robust in, in, um, uh, in, reproduce, in reproducing its parameters. So what do these qubits look like in reality? This is a, an SEM, scanning SEM picture um, of this paper in the bottom. You see that there is something that looks like a, a teeth. This is the capacitor, so it's like two capacitor plates uh, close to each other. And then in the center, there's this little loop and that's where the junction is. And so in um, electrical circuit notation, this is what the, the circuit would be. Um, this geometry here is called the planar geometry because it's on a surface of a chip, but there is uh, also the possibility to couple these qubits to three-dimensional um, electromagnetic fields in a cavity. And then you need to change the geometry a little bit. And instead of these teeth, you have these two large rectangles. So this picture, I, sorry, I didn't add any, any, any scale here. So this teeth is about uh, 100 to 300 microns, typically. And these 3D transmon, as they are called, they're more like about a millimeter. So you can actually see them with your naked eye. At least the capacitor you can see, not the junction, of course. And so these qubits uh, are, are quite good because their um, coherence times are very long lived. Here I'm just showing you plots of, of uh, this three dimensional type of transmon qubit. And uh, in fact, I will not explain a lot about these curves now, I will explain them later um, when I talk a little bit more how to control these qubits. Okay, um, so actually I will just skip this uh, slide. Um, and uh, I want to just highlight that over the years, the, num the, the coherence time of these qubits has increased significantly. In, like I said, in 99, the first qubit had a coherence time, which was a nanosecond. So that was a very short lived, this charged qubit. And then uh, a few years later, some discovery happened and then the, the coherence time increased. And then some years later, new uh, phenomena happened. So this has been like a jump over jump, but steadily increasing. Uh, this plot is actually outdated, uh, but there's already qubits that have coherence times on the order of uh, 300 microseconds. And uh, you see that this trend keeps on increasing. And what matters is that this red dashed line that's where uh, you have a threshold to implement quantum error correction. So already there are qubits that have been made that are compatible with this uh, quantum error correction threshold. And that means that the superconducting qubits are coming close to being able to implement the surface code. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do, but at least the, the progress has been steady and it doesn't look like it will be stopping anytime soon. Okay, so how do you read out the state of these qubits? For that, um, I'm just moving into some historical reference into cavity QED actually, because that's where uh, this is coming from. In cavity QED, uh, what people have been doing over many years, and this is the example of the lab of Professor Jeff Kimball in Caltech, where I actually spent two years some time ago, uh, what they did was they were detecting atoms. They were detecting atoms interacting with photons in cavities, in optical cavities. This is a picture of one of their papers, two mirrors very close to each other. You cannot even see how close they are. And then in the middle, they were dropping atoms, cold atoms. 
And during the time the atoms were held in this, uh, within the mirrors of this cavity, they were actually optically trapped. There was an interaction between the two, two states of these atoms and then the electromagnetic field of this cavity. And uh, so this uh, system can be described by a very simple um, Hamiltonian, which is known as the James Cummings Hamiltonian. And in the regime in which the qubit and this resonator are not resonant, um, this uh, Hamiltonian has the following form in which uh, here the, there is a qubit term, sigma z, and a resonator term, term a dagger a. And what matters is that the resonance frequency of the resonator acquires a term here that depends on the qubit state. And this is known as the start shift or the, the dynamical start shift or AC start shift. And um, this means that if you are reading out or if you measure the frequency of your cavity, you're indirectly reading out the qubit state. So this is a nearly quantum non-demolition measurement. I'm saying nearly because this is this Hamiltonian is not exact, it's an approximate Hamiltonian. There are it's a perturbative Hamiltonian, there are more, more terms. Um, but uh, essentially the idea is that it's a very clean um, way to detect the state of a qubit that doesn't require even a, a accessing the qubit itself. So uh, this, this idea was translated into electrical circuits in 2004 by the group of uh, yeah, Shulkov at Yale. And uh, instead of a, a optical cavity, they used a coplanar waveguide uh, resonator. So now here you see this, this chip that has these uh, wiggles, these meanders. This is a continuous superconducting uh, wire that is interrupted at both ends. So it's a, it's a, it's a finite length. And uh, therefore it, it supports resonances that are um, a function of the length of this cavity. So the length is chosen to have resonances in the range of frequencies of this qubit. So I didn't explain that yet, but these qubits resonate in the domain of the uh, gigahertz frequent uh, energies and frequencies, which is microwaves. So essentially it's a microwave uh, artificial atom, if you wish. And these cavities, these resonators, they also resonate in the range of, uh, mic uh, of the microwaves. Um, and then in this particular experiment, which was the first one ever, uh, trying this, uh, they put one of these charged qubits, which you see here, uh, very close to this center line of this resonator. And so they observe that these two systems can interact and essentially reproduce the exact same physics that I was explaining in the previous slide uh, with optics. Um, and here is, is some actual measurement of, uh, of this one of these resonators as a function of um, uh, in this case could be the, the gate, the, the charge, the, the gate voltage of, for, this, for this type of qubit. Um, and so when you measure, this is a measurement of the transmission through this cavity. When you measure this transmission, you will see a peak when, the, when you uh, are exciting this cavity on resonance. And depending on the qubit state, this peak will be slightly displaced. And then you would see the blue uh, distribution or the red distribution. And the two of them, are separated enough so that you can actually tell each other. Of course, it's not it's not um, uh, hundred percent visibility, but it is good enough that most of the time you can tell what what is the state of the qubit. Th this is the very standard uh, way to detect qubits, but it has been perfected a lot, and uh, it's it's uh, it's possible today to uh, obtain visibilities above ninety nine percent. Um, so this was what, uh, let's say, this is kind of like the state of the art in, the, in this field of how things are, are performed. And this now, um, I'm, I'm jumping to our, uh, our lab and I will start talking about how do we manipulate these, these qubits. So that's a picture of the cryostat, the dilution refrigerator that we used. Uh, this is in the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, which is nearby uh, IFAE. Um, and uh, this was operated the last two years when we still didn't have our own uh, refrigerators. And it has been very useful to implement uh, this algorithm that I will describe uh, shortly. So this, this is essentially a cryostat, but the uh, special feature is that it can cool down to temperatures 
very close to absolute zero, mm -hmm. essentially 10 millikelvins above absolute zero. And inside of this cryostat, um, mm -hmm. which uh, looks like that, so it has some, some metallic plates. And then uh, these plates are at, set at different temperatures when this device is operating. And the one below, the one at the bottom, is the one that cools to 10 millikelvin. So anything we attach to this plate will be cooled down. And so we design a cavity, which you see in this picture. This is a aluminum. This is only actually only half of the cavity. The other half looks identical, and then we close it together. And then this, this uh, uh, hole in the middle has the dimensions to resonate in the gigahertz range of frequencies. And in the middle, you see this chip. This black is a silicon, so this is um, conventional silicon. And then in the center, you see these two squares, and that's the capacitor of the qubit. And if we zoom in a lot with the electron microscope, we see that this is this uh, junction that is um, on top of the, well, the it's, it's an electrode on top of the other electrode. Actually, uh, this is a, a picture from a dead qubit. And you see what happened that there was a, a discharge and then this uh, amount of metal shorted the junction. So this is um, non-functional junction. And this, uh, importantly, this junction was provided to us by the KIT, uh, so the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which is a, a group of uh, Professor Martin Baides that I'm collaborating with. So we put this device into this cryostat. We uh, activate, uh, activated the cryostat, and then we can start doing measurements. So how do you uh, control the qubit state? So essentially, if you know the physics of two-level systems, and I'm going to atomic, atomic physics, then that's all you need to know. Because um, you need to, uh, if you apply uh, energies which are in the neighborhood of the qubit energy splitting, then you will be able to interact with the qubit. And so this picture is a microwave generator, like the ones we have in our lab. And the physics of this problem is essentially the Rabi formula, in which the probability uh, that the qubit uh, moves from the ground to the excited state uh, oscillates in time, as long as this external um, external field is applied. And this rate of os oscillation is known as the Rabi frequency. Um, so this, this uh, problem is 100% analogous to the spin one half in a magnetic field, uh, polarized in the Z uh, axis, and uh, having a, a weak oscillating field in the x-axis, so in which then the spin starts to precess around this um, external uh, transverse field. And so this is essentially the, the problem that of nuclear magnetic resonance. And you can import all the nuclear magnetic resonance techniques for controlling the qubit state. Um, the first observation you, you do when you start measuring a qubit is the Rabi oscillations themselves. And here I'm showing data from our qubit this is the time scale and on the vertical scale, this is the voltage we detect across the cavity, but it is essentially the qubit uh, population. So high voltage implies low qubit population. So that means it's the ground state of the qubit. And then the signal oscillates in time and it is quite coherent. We don't see over this time scale, we don't see any, any decay. And the time scale here is in nanoseconds. So this is a very fast oscillation. Um, the next, uh, the next measurement you uh, implement is how long does the energy stays in the qubit if you excite it. So for that, we look at these oscillations and then we see that at, around, at a time around 15 nanoseconds, the qubit is excited. So if we stop the driving at that time, we will leave the qubit in the excited state. And that's what we are doing here. We apply this pi pulse pi because it's in this uh, picture of the block sphere in which you can represent the qubit. So the qubit state is rotated 180 degrees. Then we wait, and then we read out. And then we change the time to do the readout until we don't see uh, any qubit in the uh, excited state. And that's this trace you see here. It's this exponential decay. And when we fit this, this formula for this device, we get about 15 microseconds. And uh, if you compare to these 15 nanoseconds of uh, time to flip the qubit, then we have a relatively good device. We, have, we can implement about a thousand 
a thousand gates within its T1 time. Um, so these qubits don't only suffer from uh, noise that relaxes its qubit state, they also suffer from dephasing. And so that means if we prepare the qubit in a superposition, like this uh, plot here, this arrow is pointing, um, the azimuthal phase could, could be washed out due to noise, due to low frequency noise over time. And that operates in a different time scale than the processes that absorb energy from the qubit, which are the ones that cause relaxation. So to probe this T2 time, the dephasing time, you first apply a pi over two so that you rotate the qubit in this uh, equator. You wait until this uh, qubit state starts precessing. You apply another pi over two pulse to project the state of the qubit in the Z axis, which is our measurement axis, and then you, we do the measurement. And so we see uh, this oscillating signal that decays. This is known as the Ramsey fringe. And then this decay time, you see it's 10 microseconds. So it's shorter than the T1 time. And the relation between T1 and T2 is given by this expression where T phi is the pure dephasing. So it's the time that the qubit dephases purely. Um, so there here, um, one can apply many tricks from nuclear magnetic resonance. The simplest one is called the spin echo. And then you, you intercalate a pi pulse between the two pi over two pulses and this to reverse the dynamics of the spin or the qubit on the equator. So it actually cancels the contribution from the slowest noise, no, the noise that is essentially static. And then you can increase this decay time from 10 to about 12 microseconds for this device. Um, and there's many, many more tricks, but um, essentially this device is ready to run an algorithm. Okay. so. How much time do I have left? Because we started a bit late, just to give me some reference. Um, uh, sorry, Esperanza, you're muted. <laughs> uh, you have a still a quarter of an hour. Perfect, okay, thank you. Okay, so let me describe to you this algorithm that, that we put together. Um, actually, it was the group of Pasignacio put together and we put it in, uh, in programmed it in our device. Um, so this universal approximant has to do with uh, approxim approximation theorems to approximate mathematical functions. Um, so essentially you want to uh, find a way to express a certain function as a sum of uh, another set of functions and uh, with some coefficients that mm, reproduce the one function you want to, uh, you want to represent. And this is, a, here is the example of, uh, this, uh, this kind of like zigzag using uh, Fourier, Fourier components. So obviously the Fourier series is one of these, uh, one of these uh, examples. Uh, so the question is what kind of functions can be approximated here? How well? And then what are these, these individual elements and these parameters in these, in these functions? And so there's some examples uh, for these functions. There's the spherical harmonics, the gender of functions, Hermit polynomials, vessel functions. So this is already uh, well known in, in mathematics. But what's new here is that we are extending this, um, this approximation into uh, quantum circuits. So now we want to encode this function in the quantum state of our qubit. And here I'm only going to talk about single qubit, but this can be extended to multiple qubits. But the idea is that starting from an initial state, you apply a set of gates that depend on some set of parameters, theta, and then they bring you to some final state. And this final state contains the function that we want to approximate. So the number of uh, unitary gates we have here is analogous to this uh, uh, number of functions that you have in, in, this, in this classical decomposition. Um, and um, this quantum state at the end of this process may look like this, so that we have this coefficient for the excited state of the qubit that has amplitude and phase. And so the amplitude of our, or let's say, or the population of our qubit directly gives us the function that we want to reproduce as a function of this x, which is some parameter in our, in our system. And so in our case, we have uh, picked two different uh, ways of approximating uh, this 
So this the algorithm uh, is 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 uh, uh, originated from two uh, classical uh, sets of functions. One is the Fourier series, and the other one is the universal approximant theorem that comes from um, uh, from actually from neural networks, uh, where it, where the, a neural network can be uh, demonstrated to represent any function. And so this decomposition of, uh, of discrete functions can be translated into this unitary operator that contains a set of uh, rotations, qubit rotations. And these are the ones you need to implement for the, to mimic the Fourier series. And these are the rotations you need to implement to mimic this universal approximate theorem. And um, now uh, this uh, entire function is, is chopped in small bits because this is the, let's say the exact, and then we discretize it and different, in different layers. And the more layers we apply, the more approximate, so the, the better is the approximation of this, of this function we are trying to represent. Um, so this, these parameters theta will be, um, so in order to find them, in order to obtain these parameters, this will be fed into a classical optimization algorithm that will try to match the function we are targeting. So essentially now we are implementing this, this technique that I was describing in the beginning, where we uh, rotate our qubit state into a final function. This produces some uh, scalar value, which is the value of the function we want to obtain. And then this goes into a cost function. The cost function um, gives us some number, and then we try to improve this cost function by changing these theta parameters, running the algorithm again, and repeating this operation until our final value of this uh, function you want to represent is, is close to our target. Um, so, okay, so here I'm gonna present some theoretical results, some, some simulations using what we call the Z benchmark. So it's, it's essentially uh, st storing the, this function in the uh, observable Z, so this is the Pauli matrix Z of the quantum state. And so that's what this looks like uh, for the Fourier representation and for this universal approximate representation for different functions. Here I'm showing a hyperbolic tangent, the step function, polynomial, and then the ReLU, which is uh, used in neural networks, which is zero for negative values of X and is equal to X for positive values. And you see for different layers, this is the uh, degree of the approximation. The more layers we implement, the closer uh, it is to the real function. The real function is plotted in black uh, in the background. And you see that this uh, algorithm works well for, for both sets of uh, decomposed functions. Uh, we can do more. We can actually extend this to, uh, to do an XY benchmark that allows us to uh, also represent complex functions. So now we have uh, the quantum state where the face of the quantum state is used to represent the real and the imaginary part. And so if we impl implement this into the simulations, for example, in this case, uh, this function has a real part, which is a hyperbolic tangent and the imaginary part, which is a ReLU function. And again, the simulation shows you that this approximate algorithm works both for the Fourier decomposition and for the universal approximant. All right, so this is uh, theoretical. So now we go to the experiment and we implement this sequence of gates to our qubit. And so this is what we get. This is experimental data from this device. And again, for different numbers of layers, we see that the, uh, the function that we are representing is becoming closer and closer to this black line. It's not perfect, so we can, we can keep iterating, adding more layers to, uh, to achieve an exact representation. And here I'm just showing an example of um, what, this, um, uh, what the gates look like for different values of x. So for x equals to minus 0 0.5 here. So these are the angles. In, in, in radians, angles of the rotations that we need to implement for y rotation, z rotation, y rotation, z rotation, and so on. And so these are the kind of angles. And this is what the, for a single uh, point, 
This one corresponds to close to one, x equals one. This is how the qubit state evolves uh, when we apply all of these rotations. So we start in the ground state and then we start exciting the qubit. Then we go back, go up and down. So after a certain amount of wiggles, we end up in the value actually no, this is wrong. This is in the opposite side. This should be uh, the arrow should be pointing here. Yeah, in the in the uh, negative side. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So if we compare our experiment with the theoretical simulations, so in blue is the experiment, and in red is the simulation. We see that the uh, comparison is quite is quite good, and so that tells us. So I sh I didn't say that, but the simulations. They don't include any decoherence, so they assume unitary evolution. But in our qubit, we definitely have decoherence, as I have showed you before. But since the sequence, uh, let me go back. Since the sequence that we implement takes at most half a microsecond, and our coherence time is 10 microseconds, mm -hmm. so we are not really uh, limited by decoherence in this uh, in this algorithm. Uh, this is for the ReLU function. We have done the same experiment for the hyperbolic tangent. And uh, this is uh, experimental data for a different um, number of layers that approach the hyperbolic tangent, even though there's still some oscillation. And then comparing to the, to the theoret theoretical uh, result, which also is the red, the red trace also shows some, some oscillations. But essentially, our algorithm, we show that, that it works. It follows uh, the, the theory quite well. And so this is essentially the, uh, let's say, our, our result. Um, there is more to that. We can actually implement not only uh, uh, functions of a single variable, we can implement multivariable functions uh, as it is shown in this preliminary plot. But this is work in progress and uh, this is also again, done with a single qubit. And so the, yeah, what matters is how, how many um, parameters you can encode in your, in your qubit state. Okay, so that's the end of this presentation. And I'm just going to conclude by reminding you of the highlights. So pay attention to the next five years because there's gonna be a lot of changes, but I would say more towards the end of the five years than to the beginning. So there's going to be a lot of changes in the quantum computing uh, world. And very soon, even though the full quantum error correction will not be implemented, partial quantum error correction will be there. And so there will be lots of ex exciting results. Uh, at EFI, we're developing this type of quantum processors using superconducting devices. And then in, in this uh, talk, I presented that with a single qubit, we can implement this universal Approximant, so a single qubit can approximate any function, and this is this is I am um, this is not something we can do better than classical computers, but it is a functionality we are uh, we are enabling in quantum processors, and um, of course we will be studying the scaling of this algorithm where more qubits are used and uh, where it it actually starts competing with um, with classical processors, and so. In the coming experiments, we will be uh, implementing the complex functions, multivariable, and we will also be implementing the optimization that I was talking about classically. We will be doing that with the qubit itself and maybe with two qubits and so on. Okay, so I would like to acknowledge uh, the team of people that uh, made this, uh, this work possible, Jose Ignacio and Artur as the senior theory lead, and then David Lopez, and, um, who was running the experiments, and, um, and uh, our, our theory, our theory student, Adrian, Adrian. And so this uh, device was provided to us by Professor Martin Baides from the University of Glasgow. Back then he was still in Karlsruhe. And the dilution refrigerator was uh, uh, lent to us by Professor Sergio Valenzuela at ICN2. And so I would like to thank our funding agencies and all of you for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. So questions? So may I ask, uh, when, when are you planning to have two qubits? 
Um, we are already working on the designs and uh, we will be starting to fabricate them early next year. So I'm hoping by springtime, we will be measuring two cubic devices. So now that we have the lab ready, I mean, really we, we just finished the installation last week. So this is extremely recent. Mm -hmm. um, so we are now preparing the lab for experiments. And so once we are ready, then we will be nonstop doing, doing experiments with single and multi qubit devices. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So some further question? Well, I have a question. Uh, this uh, so you, <clears throat> you in this, see, I understood that you uh, have a function and then you just generate an state with that, right? Yes. Right. So uh, then you can also put uh, basically I don't know, I was wondering about an alphabet. Imagine an alphabet, and then you can also associate to every letter in the alphabet a quantum state, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you could. Like, uh, so, and then, but how, what is the comparison between the Fourier, let's say, and the method you are using? The, someone, is, someone is better than the other, or one can compare both? You mean the, the two methods that I was talking about? Method. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. um, well, I guess this depends on the kind of function you are representing. Uh, it may be more favorable to be represented by Fourier series or by the other type of function. But I know that Adrian is in the audience. So if, Adrian, if you have any further insight on this, you may, you may give me a hand. Hi, uh, hi, can you see me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, Hi everyone. I'm Adrian. I'm in charge of the theoretical part of this work. Uh, well, I want I would like to say about this question uh, following. Uh, in principle, if you use if you use the the qubit, well, not the a single qubit gate that is defined in this work, you can tune the par the parameters to match exactly the same the, the same coefficients and same frequencies and everything that is achieved. Through the through the standard Fourier method, nevertheless, we have um, we use some variational method to find to well to look for the parameters to to implement into the quantum circuit. So uh, by using this variational method, we know that at least we can have the Fourier result, but uh, optimization procedures may may provide us with even better results than the than the Fourier one. So at least, uh, at least with the Fourier with the Fourier method, they are at least equivalent, but are uh, are are likely to be to be better. Does this method, this idea, uh, have applications to I don't know cryptography or something like that? Because at the moment, it looks like a mathematical uh, interplay, right? So, but, well, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, this could this could have application to everything that com that has to do with uh, storing some function, some functionality in a quantum in a quantum device. For instance, we have made some some tests by by using this kind of method into well into fitting uh, fitting uh, 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 parton distribution functions for protons that is already published. So, uh, so we can have, so we can, yeah, we can, we can develop uh, a quantum device that is able to fit the, the the content of 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 a proton. So this could be a this could be a an implement, uh, yeah, an application on that. Anything that works with some functionality, or that requires storing a functionality in a in a in a quantum in a quantum device, is well, is ready to be, uh, well, is ready to have this kind of of approach. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. And again. <laughs> okay. Some other question? Okay. So then, uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the talk. Uh, and then uh, we move to the to the coffee break. And. Um, uh, I think we will be back uh, uh, quarter to six. Pepe?
That's right. That's right. We are back uh, at 17.45 for the last uh, talk of the workshop. Okay. We have a little break now. Thank you. Thank you.